Joint Resolution 18. And much like the other delegate asked, we can close our eyes and just think about just these words. Because at this moment, we are not voting on the enabling legislation that could make it better. We are voting on just the words before you. Not the promises of change to come, because those are not guaranteed and actually are near impossible. Madam Speaker, a lot of money has been spent in getting the yes votes that may show up on this resolution. Shiny flyers and a lot of talking points. The lobbyists have even included personal attacks, falsehoods, and misinformation. They've sold this amendment based on using the enabling legislation as the crutch, but as we saw today, if there is a shift in the balance of power, all bets are off with the enabling legislation. What the lobbyists haven't done is explain away the fatal flaws of the amendment, and I simply have to question why. Why acknowledge the flaws and then still pressure members to support it? What they also haven't explained, Madam Speaker, is why they are doing the heavy lifting for Republicans. It's because of the amount of time and resources that have been invested. And that, quite frankly, is not my problem. My concern, however, is the amount of myths being perpetuated in their conversations in order to deliver, as my colleague said, something. One myth is that people have been working very hard for years on this amendment. And if we vote no, we would be throwing that all away. That's simply not true. As we have heard today, what we have in front of us was a conference report in the General Assembly last year. It is a democratic idea turned into word gymnastics as to align with the lines in the sand that last year's leadership had drawn. This amendment isn't even what the advocates want. It's what's been sold as the only real reform, and that's just not true. Also, as we've heard today, another myth says that the voting rights protections are enshrined in the amendment. But no, Madam Speaker, they are cross-referenced. The VRA is simply pointed to in this amendment, but Madam Speaker and members, there's no secret that it is under attack. And evidenced by our need for House Bill 761, carried by Delegate Van Volkenberg, the Voting Rights Act is only as strong as the future United States Supreme Court justices let it be or that Congress reenacts it to be. Just like other issues, Madam Speaker, we are facing where states have to step up and do the right thing and protect its residents. The Senate agreed, actually, because during the committee meeting for the preclearance bill, they discussed the peril that awaits the Voting Rights Act in coming years. If the Voting Rights Act gets further watered down, guess what we will be left with with Senate Joint Resolution 18? the 14th Amendment, Madam Speaker. Y'all, might I remind you that the 14th Amendment was fully intact during the Jim Crow era. This situation is what I would call not enshrined in the language of the amendment. Some are saying that structural racism doesn't exist anymore. They point to uh, President Barack Obama. They point to the uh, number of black caucus members that we have this, this time. But I would offer that it is because of the Voting Rights Act that we have been able to make such great progress. So then again I say that the state level needs to step up, and that's those of us right here in this room. Madam Speaker, I want to be very clear that the Bethune Hill decision did not create black districts. The decision removed the intentional and deemed unconstitutional obstacles that were placed to prevent more black electeds from coming to this body. And 
as other civil rights movements items. Some of you are only here because of that decision. When you protect against the disenfranchisement of African American communities, you protect all voters. What we had in the substitute was 22 lines of text that could have better protected us than just a mention. That is what I would have called enshrined. Spell it out, don't just cross-reference. Golden Bethune Hill herself has commented on how healthcare needs of people across the Commonwealth have been impacted by diminishing the voices of black leaders who can speak to the concerns based on lived experiences. So she stated how important it is to have an independent process. And to those who would so disingenuously say that we can just fix it later, we heard from Delegate Scott that we still have federally deemed unconstitutional language in our state constitution, so I don't buy that. But what I do know is that I should not expect the fundraising, the hiring of lawyers, the town halls all across the Commonwealth, the talking points with guest speakers and shiny flyers in order to just come back to get that voting rights language. It's not the same and it's virtually impossible. Another myth is that Senate Joint Resolution ends gerrymandering. But the truth is, looking at this amendment, there are no redistricting criteria that would accomplish the end of gerrymandering. In the substitute, there were eight. Eight criteria that directly dealt with political and racial gerrymandering. Another myth, Madam Speaker, is that it's independent. It takes drawing maps out of the hands of legislators, and I don't even know how that's legal to say. There are eight whole legislators on this commission. And in addition to having eight legislators, Senate Joint, Senate Joint Resolution 18 gives two members of either the Senate or the House the power to thwart the process. We need independent redistricting reform, not guaranteeing eight seats at the map drawing table for legislators into the future. Another myth is that the commission is nonpartisan. No, it's bipartisan. As we've heard, no room for independence. And I would say it's actually hyperpartisan for those two members of any party that can kill the process. Then there's the point that the Senate Joint Resolution 18 prevents mid-decade gerrymandering. Well, Madam Speaker, our Constitution already does that. And here's another one. There's lots of public input. The amendment only requires three public meetings for the entire state. Madam Speaker, we would need three just for Hampton Roads. The timing of which, depending upon the census data, is that legislators would have to run to these, these hearings while they're in session. Another myth is that there will be guaranteed diversity on the commission. And this morning, Madam Speaker, I watched the Senate and it was a really interesting conversation. The fears about the amendment not having diversity in the commission were supposedly put aside because we have black senators that can ensure the commission is diverse. But however, Madam Speaker, if you read the amendment, the only part that the current leadership plays a part in is choosing the selection committee. Once they are chosen, there are no words that mandate diversity for the commission. But even if our fears were assuaged for 2021, I do not have the luxury of being short-sighted. I must also think about when considering a constitutional amendment, 2031, 2041, 2051, 2061, and so on. This isn't about any of us as individuals. This is about how future processes will work. And further, the, sen the senator raised the point that the role of one black senator also pointed to the enabling legislation to back up. What he didn't say is that the enabling legislation probably won't even make it to 2031. What a difference a year makes, Madam Speaker, because we do have powerful black leaders this year, but last year we didn't. 
Last year, we didn't even have diverse voices on the conference committee under Republican leadership. When we aren't at the table, who shall speak for us? There was, however, diversity at the table when we took a weak piece of enabling legislation and made it strong. That is the demonstrated factor that voice versus voices lead to better products. Our request is not for quotas. Our request is simply for the commission to have to reflect the demographics of the Commonwealth. The last myth, Madam Speaker, has been uh, debunked as well. The only year, this is the only year that we can do this until 2030. We have already voted on reform, and it is headed to the governor's desk. And we can do more, but we've got to do it right. The further issues that you've heard are actually probably the most important, because this would impact whether you're white, black, Asian, Republican, Democrat. And that is the timeline issue, Madam Speaker. There are significant problems with the timeline in the language of the amendment that could call into question the integrity of our ability to hold our elections without cutting into early voting, the time for our overseas friends to be able to vote, or maybe we should just have a short primary season for incumbent protection, Madam Speaker. But that's not what we fought so hard for, for the integrity and the pieces of legislation for our bills that we put through. We have had our private discussions on how bad the amendment is and that it doesn't need to be in our, in our Constitution. And I am publicly stating for you now all of the flaws. We do not have to do this in this way. And I would submit if you vote yes, you are consciously choosing to vote yes, despite all of the flaws that have been outlined, despite the pleas from your colleagues to help put actual needed protections into your constitution, and despite the diverse voices in your districts that, you, that they need you to stand with them too. And as I close, Madam Speaker, the emails have been asking us to vote yes, but they were based on these myths. My job as a leader is to go back home and debunk them, and that's what I've done. I have to base it on the actual words of the amendment that were debunked in part by the actual patron of this resolution and by several members who have spoken on the floor. But no matter how many times you say a myth, it doesn't make it true. We can't operate on myths, we must operate on facts. So, you may want to vote for this in order to help re restore trust in our system, but I would say that the trust you're asking the people to have is in two people who already demonstrated that they don't want to play by rules. Let's instead ask the public to watch our every step. Watch our every step as we work toward a better amendment. We have everyone on both sides saying that they want something, let's give it to them. Madam Speaker, the fact is we need a resolution that actually addresses the concerns that spurred the cries for redistricting reform from the beginning. We've already passed the legislation that would end gerrymandering. We have the ability to do a legislative fix for a commission for 2021 and choose that 2021 together with those pieces could be the most transparent, independent, and fair redistricting process that we have had that will not allow gerrymandering. That is what the people have asked for. And if you vote no today, we can still deliver on that promise. So I urge you to vote no on Senate Joint Resolution 18. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. The delegate